I will invite you to please turn your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 12. And we shall read verses 49 to the end of the chapter. Luke 12, beginning from verse 49. The Lord speaking to his disciples, I have come to cast fire upon the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo, and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. Do you suppose that I came to grant peace on earth? I tell you no, but rather division. For from now on, five members in one household will be divided. Three against two and two against three. They will be divided. Father against son and son against father. Mother against daughter and daughter against mother. mother Mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. And he was also saying to the crowds, When you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say, a shower is coming. And so it turns out. And when you see a south wind blowing, you say, it will be a hot day. And it turns out that way. You hypocrites. You know how to analyze the appearance of the earth and the sky. But why do you not analyze this present time? And why do you not even on your own initiative judge what is right? For when you are going with your opponent to appear before the magistrate on your way there, make an effort to settle with him so that he may not drag you before the judge and the judge turn you over to the officer and the officer throw you into prison. I say to you, You will not get out of there until you have paid the very last cent. The Lord Jesus is known for making startling statements. Statements that shock us. Statements that we least expect he will ever say. Now this portion of scripture read in your hearing is one of those startling statements from the lips of the Savior. And there can be no doubt when when the Lord Jesus first spoke these words to his disciples, His original disciples could not have fully understood everything he said. And there can be no doubt that only after Jesus' death and resurrection would the meaning really be clear to them as to what he meant by what he said. And yet, what he said to them, he wanted them to hear. And in time, understand what he really meant. And it would do us well if we pay close attention to this startling statement from the Savior. That which he wants us to hear. Now as we look at the passage, let us look, let us consider first what the Lord Jesus said he came to do. What the Lord Jesus said he came to do. Verses 49, notice what he says. I came to cast fire upon the earth. And how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo and how distressed I am. 
until it is accomplished. Now here are words from the Savior, cryptic statement that he says. And what does that mean? Well, we know that the word fire in Scripture, oh, here the word fire is in an emphatic position in the original. Verse 49 could also be more literally translated, a fire. I have come to cast upon the earth. And how I wish it were already set ablaze. At the time Jesus spoke these words, the fire has not yet been set ablaze. But Jesus wished that it already were ablaze. And once it is set ablaze, it will set the world on fire. And what is this fire? When is or was it kindled? When was it or was it cast on the earth? Well, there can be no doubt that fire in Scripture is a metaphor for both judgment and purification. It's a common figure of speech. In the Bible, in the Old Testament and New Testament times, as well as now, fire is used to purify silver and gold. And how was that done? Well, one writer says this, and let me just quote his words. The process of purifying gold and silver with fire. The refining gold and silver follow the same process which is in fact, quite simple. The impure gold or silver is placed along with pieces of lead into a crucible type vessel. It is then placed into a furnace where the metal melts and mixes with the lead forming a molten liquid mass of metal. Air under force is then blown into the surface of the molten metal while still in the furnace. Gold and silver do not react with the air, whereas the lead and any impurities like thin, copper, and iron do react. The lead, once it comes in contact with the blowing air, reacts, then circulates throughout the molten metal. The circulating reacted lead then absorbs all the other metal impurities to form a mixture called dross, which evaporates or floats to the surface. The floating dross is then subsequently blown over to the edge of the crucible by the blasting air and is consumed by the furnace. The gold or silver is then left behind in the crucible, free of all impurities. That's the purifying of silver. That's the purifying of gold. This process, well known in biblical times, therefore, is used as a metaphor of both judgment and purification. Fire. And this metaphor is used by the prophet Malachi to describe the coming of Messiah. If you turn to Malachi chapter 1 verses 1 to 5, notice the language. There is a double, double imagery. In Malachi chapter 3 verse 1, we read, Behold, God speaking through the prophet Malachi because of the sins of the old covenant people, because of their unfaithfulness to the covenant of God. And yet God says in verse 1, Behold, I am going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight Behold, he is coming, saith the Lord of hosts. But then notice what his coming would be like. Verse 2, but who can endure the day of his coming? 
who can stand when he appears, for he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a smelter and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi, refine them like gold and silver, so that they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old, as in former days. Then I will draw near to you for judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, and against those who oppress the wage earners in his wages, the widow and the orphan, and those who turn aside the alien and do not fear me, said the Lord of Although God will preserve a remnant, He will come in judgment. He will come in judgment to His people. This metaphor is used in Malachi of fire. This judgment has already begun at the first coming of the Lord Jesus. That judgment began with His own house. The Jewish people, God's people under the old covenant during his first coming. And it was going to spread forth even to the Gentiles. But before that happens, something else must also happen. Look at verse 50 of Luke 12. In verse 49, I have come to cast fire upon the earth and how I wish it were already kindled or set ablaze, but I have a baptism to undergo and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. Now the structure of verse 50 in the original is almost identical with Verse 49, the previous verse. And it's meant to explain what must happen first or in conjunction with the casting of the fire on earth. The conjunction translated but is not the conjunction Allah, which is a strong adversative, but it is the conjunction day, which can be translated and. And therefore, it is not intended to be a contrast, but a coordinate thought, a parallel thought. The casting of the fire and the baptism that Jesus will undergo is our corresponding events. And like the word fire in the previous verse, the word baptism here is also in an emphatic position in the original. Verse 50 could also be literally translated, A baptism I have come to be baptized with, and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. And what is this baptism? Jesus said he had to undergo. Well, here, all commentators are agreed. He's definitely not speaking about his water baptism when he began his public ministry. That has already happened. But this refers to Jesus' suffering and death on Calvary, which was the climax of his mission on earth. The Lord Jesus describes it as a baptism because in Calvary he was going to be immersed into suffering and judgment. His soul was going to be plunged into the abyss of God's holy wrath against human sin in order to pay for its penalty and redeem those whom he came to save. 
when he had himself had himself baptized by John in the river of Jordan he identif he was identifying himself with sinners he had no sin and yet the baptism of John was a baptism of repentance those who had himself baptized were saying that i am a sinner and i want to turn away from my sin and find my hope in the coming of messiah jesus had no sin and yet he had himself baptized john at first reacted to what jesus was asking him to do you should baptize me but jesus said no we must fulfill all righteousness he had himself baptized in the river jordan why because there he identified himself with sinners he stood as representative sin bearer as the substitute all the sins of god's people were imputed to him and he was going to die for all the sins of his people to expiate their sins to propitiate for their sins to provide a just basis for reconciliation and forgiveness of sins and when he dies on the cross it's going to be a baptism of suffering he will be immersed under the holy wrath God as the representative sin bearer in the language of Corinthians he made him who knew no sin a sin on our behalf and he bore the curse of the law in order to redeem his people and up until that was accomplished jesus in anticipation of it was in perpetual distress i have a baptism to undergo or literally a baptism i have come to be baptized with and how distressed i am until it is accomplished this distress was heightened or greatly intensified in Gethsemane that Luke describes that distress graphically that he records even the fact that Jesus sweat drops like sweat like drops of blood falling to the ground and as plumber puts it this prospect of his suffering was a perpetual gethsemane so clear from the parallel wordings of verse 49 and verse 50 is that the fire jesus said he came to cast on earth happened when jesus accomplished his mission on earth when he died as a representative sin bearer on calvary it was particularly at his death on calvary that the fire was cast on earth the work of judgment and purification has already begun and it began in god's house the old covenant community that work began in God's house and that work will be completed and perfected at the second coming of Christ. The fire has been cast. The fire that judges and purifies his people. And That is what Jesus said he came to do. 
But then note, secondly, in the passage, what the Lord said should be our response to what he came to do. What should be our response? Well, first, he addresses his disciples. And with respect to his disciples, we can summarize what he said in these words. Be prepared for separation and division. Look at his language. Be prepared for separation and division. Look at verse 51. The Lord said, Do you suppose that I came to grant peace on earth? I tell you no, but rather division. From now on in redemptive history, at that point in redemptive history, from now on five members in one household will be divided three against two and two against three. They will be divided father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Now, it's clear from the context that these words are addressed by Christ particularly to his disciples. This discourse of Christ began way all the way back to chapter 12, verse 1. And it's clear there that this lengthy discourse recorded by Luke under the infallible guidance of the Spirit is addressed to the disciples. Well, verse 1, under these circumstances, after so many thousands of people had gathered together that they were stepping on one another, he began saying, not to the crowds, the many thousands, he began saying to his disciples first of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Okay, And then he addresses the crowd. And then in verse 22, And he said to his disciples, For this reason I say to you, do not worry about light. He's addressing his disciples. And then in verse 41, Peter said, Lord, are you addressing this parable to us, his disciples, or to everyone else as well, the rest of the crowd? The Lord said, Who then is the faithful and sensible steward whom his master will put in charge of his servant to give them their rations? In other words, Jesus is basically saying, I'm addressing these words to you, this parable to you. And then in verse 49, we have our text. I have come to cast fire upon earth and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism to undergo in verse 51. Do not suppose that I came to grant peace on earth. I tell you no, but rather division. It's clear from the context that these words were addressed particularly to his disciples. And in this dramatic question and answer form, the Lord Jesus proceeds to make plain to his disciples what is really the result of his mission to cast fire on earth. Its result will not be peace or harmony, but division. Do not think that I came to bring peace. That I came to grant peace on earth. I tell you no, but rather division. From now on, at this point of redemptive history, five members in one household will be divided. He makes it clear that the result of his casting fire upon the earth An event that corresponds to his baptism of suffering and death on Calvary. That it will result not in peace or harmony, but division. It will divide and separate even 
very intimate and precious and dear human relationships. Therefore, in that sense, and in that sense alone, Jesus did not come to bring peace or harmony, but division. When fire was cast on the earth, particularly at the death of the Lord Jesus, the judgment of the earth began. Just like fire separates gold from its impurities, so Jesus also came to cast fire on earth to separate his true people from those who were not. In order to separate God's true people from those who were not God's true people. And this will divide humanity into two. Those who are true believers in Christ and those who are not. It's going to divide. And this fire of judgment and purification began with God's house. Old Israel. His people under the old covenant. There was a sense in which it already began even at the time of John the Baptist in his work of reorganizing the nation of Israel, separating the repentant and believing from the unrepentant and believing in order to prepare a people for the Lord. That was the mission of John the Baptist. But the critical point of that work happened during only during the death of Christ and his subsequent death resurrection or his subsequent resurrection exaltation and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost the Jewish nation separated from the Gentile nation even the Jewish nation and their families will be divided those who followed Christ and those who would not. And remember the most critical point in which that division will be made manifest was when Jesus died. The Jews rejected him. Those who would follow him as the Savior and those who would not would be separated. Father, mother, brother, sister, mother-in-law, daughter-in-law, father-in-law, son-in-law, and only those who believed were baptized and added to the church. That's the beginning. The judging, purifying work of Christ's mission. And can you imagine Jewish families? Some would believe in Christ, some would not. Those who would believe in the Messiah who died, that he is the Messiah, that he is the Savior, that he and they will follow him, identify with him. The rest of the Jewish family will cast them out. And the dross will be separated from the pure gold. Those who are really God's people under the old covenant will be separated from those who were not. And the inclusion of the Gentiles in the spread of the gospel and the incorporation of the believing Gentiles into God's new covenant community during the apostolic generation had the very same effect. Homes and families were divided. Those who followed Christ, 
those who did not, those who believe and followed him, those who would not. And this is something that we who are Christ's disciples must be prepared to face. Crisis do not think I came to bring peace. If you are to understand really his mission, you would not think otherwise. It is something that Christ's disciple must be prepared to face. In fact, many of us here have already experienced what the Lord Jesus here is saying. Some of us were born in homes that worship idols, desecrated a Sabbath, believed in lies, engaged in religious practices that are abominable to the Lord, conform to sinful ways and practices that are acceptable to the world, praiseworthy to the, to the world, but hateful to God. And when you embrace Christ as Savior and Lord, the message of the cross you embrace and you submit to the Lordship of Christ, while the rest of the family members did not, then your family was divided. For you no longer worship idols, and they still do. You no longer desecrate the Sabbath, and they still do. You no longer believe in lies, but they still do. No longer engage in religious practices that are abomination to the Lord, and yet they still do. And you no longer conform to the sinful ways and practices of the world that are acceptable to the world, but are hateful to God, but they still do. And when you were baptized and become a member of the new covenant community, that division is even made more visible and obvious. And this is what the Lord says He came to do. He is the refiner's fire. He came to cast fire on the earth. And therefore he came not to bring peace but division. He's going to separate the dross and the precious metal. Those who are truly his own. Now of course we must not take the words of the Lord in an absolute sense. There is also a sense in which he came to bring peace. In fact, he is named as the Prince of Peace. For those who embrace the message of the cross and submit to Jesus' lordship will have peace with God. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding. Peace in the midst of trouble. In fact, the Lord Jesus came in order to bring peace and harmony between believing Jews and believing Gentiles. Be Jews and Gentiles under the old covenant could not even eat together. They could not fellowship with one another. The Lord made a wall of separation between his old covenant people and the Gentiles. But under the new covenant, he broke that Wall of division. Believing Jews and believing Gentiles were made as one man. He brought peace. Not only with sinful humanity, Jew or Gentile and God, but also peace among believing Jews and believing Gentiles. Ephesians 2, 13 to 18. But the problem is, that since not all will identify with Christ and will become followers of Christ, then inevitably his coming will result into divisions, even in the closest 
and dearest of human relationships. And if you are a disciple of Christ, listen, be prepared for separation, for division. Be ready. Because the perfect, complete separation when Christ returned already begins here and now. When Christ came, when he died, the separation, the purification began. So be prepared for separation. For division. Even amongst the closest and dearest of human relationships. This is inevitable. If your parents, siblings, husbands, wives will not follow Christ, then you must be willing to live with that separation and division. You must be willing to live. You must not compromise your loyalty and commitment to Christ for the sake of avoiding separation and division in your closest human relationship. You must not compromise. You must be willing. If they will never become follower of Christ, be ready. And Jesus made that very clear elsewhere. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 34. He says, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the members of his household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. You must be willing to experience the pain of separation because the fire has been cast. The purifying, the judging already begins. The ultimate separation that will happen at his second coming. Where he will divide the righteous and the wicked. Those who are his own and those who are not. Has already begun when he died. From now on, he says, five families will be divided. Two against three. So be prepared for that separation and division. One of the most painful ones in my life was when I first was converted and my twin brother was not yet converted. Although the Lord saved him afterwards, it was the most painful of all separations. And we have to be ready for that. And this is also true when it comes not just to individual relationship. It is also true when it comes to the church, the new covenant community. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, Paul makes that very clear. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 4, I'm sorry, verse 14. 
Paul writes to the church in Corinth, do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we, plural, are the temple, singular. It's talking about the church. The living temple of God. For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, said the Lord. And do not touch what is unclean. And I will welcome you and I will be a father to you. And you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord. What is Paul here talking about? That the church must be separate. Only believers should become members of that church. The church is not a family institution. It is an institution for disciples of Christ. It's not a family institution. It's not a state institution. It is an institution established by Christ. And those who are to belong to it must only be those who are true disciples. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. Come out from them. Be separate. separate. The church is the community of the redeemed. And only believers must be a part of it. Because the the fire has been cast. But will not this offend unbelievers? It can. Members of the same family, and yet believers are part and members of the church. Unbelievers are not members the same family? Will not this offend them? It can. But Christ did not come to bring peace on earth, but the sword of division. And we must be willing to face that separation, that division, no matter how painful that is. But what about those who are not disciples of Christ? What about those who are not yet his disciples? What should be your response? To what the Lord said he came to do. Well, to those who are not yet his disciples, to summarize what the Lord said here in Luke 12, it is that you are to seek reconciliation from God. Look at the language, verses 54 to 59. After having said, and explain the purpose for which he came to cast fire on the earth, the result of which will be separation and division, that he will divide humanity, even at the closest level of human relationships. He then says in verse 54, and he was also saying to the crowd, When you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say a shower is coming. And so it turns out. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say it will be a hot day. And it turns out that way. You hypocrites, you know how to analyze the appearance of the earth and the sky. But you do not analyze this present time. 
And why do you not even on your own initiative judge us if what is right? For while you are going with your opponent to appear before the magistrate on your way there, make an effort to settle with him so that he may not drag you before the judge and the judge turn you over to the officer and the officers throw you into prison. I say to you, you will not get out of there until you have paid the very last sin. Now, there is an obvious shift here of the audience address. While earlier he is addressing his disciples, 12 verse 1, 12 41, now Jesus turned to the crowd in verse 54. And this is still very linked. There was a crowd there that were listening, but Jesus addressed his disciples. And now at this point, he turns to the crowd. He changes the audience. And addresses them. And what is the Lord here saying? He is saying to them that their inability the inability of the crowd to interpret that they were living at the critical point of redemptive history was completely inexcusable. In fact, it was hypocritical. It was a result of their truth suppression. Why? Because if they could give a forecast of the weather by the appearance of the earth and the sky, then why could they not interpret what was taking place in redemptive history? You see, in Palestine, rains come from the west, from the Mediterranean Sea. So when the west sky turns gray, people can expect a rainy day. They will say it will rain. And Jesus says, and you are right. Also, the hot wind blows into Palestine from desert areas in the south and the east. So when the south wind blows, people can expect it's going to be a very warm day. And Jesus says, and you are right. Now every means and every aid have been given to the Jewish crowd to enable them to interpret that they were living at the critical point in redemptive history. Messiah has come in fulfillment of prophecy. And those means and aid were just as plain as the cloud from the west and the wind from the south. They had many clear Old Testament prophecies concerning Messiah. They had a powerful preaching and testimony of John the Baptist. They had even the more powerful and authoritative preaching of Jesus, the wisdom of Jesus, the perfectly godly life of Jesus, the astounding miracles of Jesus, all of which match the Old Testament prophecies. And yet they could not interpret that they were living at the critical point in redemptive history. And this was utterly inexcusable, even hypocritical. But for the crowd to understand the critical point in redemptive history, that they were in, a, that it was, it was, where it was crucial. And what was far more important, their ability to interpret the movement of history in the light of prophecy that God has given was far more important than their ability to forecast the weather.
Let's note what Jesus further says in verse 57. He said to them, And why do you not even on your own initiative judge what is right? For while you are going with your opponent to appear before the magistrate, on your way there make an effort to settle with him so that he may not drag you before the judge and the judge turn you over to the officer and the officer throw you into prison. I say to you, you will not get out of there until you have paid the very last. Now remember that Jesus' language here is parabolic or figurative. We're not to make a one-to-one -one equation between what he said and the figure of speech that he uses. It is not to be taken literally or as if it were one-on-one. -on -one. For the truth in the parable is dressed in a language people are very familiar with. But the language which serves as the vehicle of the truth is not to be taken literally but figuratively. It is not to be applied spiritually in point-for-point -point detail aside from its obvious and basic lesson. And what's the basic lesson? In human affairs, one seeks to resolve crisis situation so as to avoid facing the full, full penalty of one's conduct. That's what you do. You do what you can to settle whatever differences you may have with someone, lest the problem be brought to court, brought to the judge, and you will be sentenced. And then you will have to pay the full consequence of the wrong that you did. So also with God. We must seek to be reconciled to Him through His Son before you face Him as your judge. Jesus says, you are at a critical point of redemptive history. The last days begun when Jesus came. The separation of his people from those who are not has already begun. And that separation will be made complete and perfect when Christ returns. The sheep and the goat. The righteous, the unrighteous. He will separate. And that separation has even begun when Christ first came. And so the Lord is saying to them, Settle your accounts before Christ. Before judgment will come. Before the final separation is made. Be reconciled. Or you will have to pay the full penalty of your sins. And that would mean an eternity in hell. Jesus is saying to the crowd, Don't you see that the separation is about to begin? Seek God. Be sure you are on his side. Be reconciled. Settle your problem with God. Be reconciled to him. Before the final separation takes place. Almost 2,000 years have passed since the Lord Jesus said his words. The fire kindled at his death on Calvary continues to burn even to this day. If you read church history, the preaching of the gospel with the power of the Holy Spirit has divided humanity and it will continue to divide humanity until Christ returns. Therefore, make sure which side you are on. If you're on the Lord's side, live with the biblical realism 
that there will always be a division between you and unbelievers. And be ready for it. Be prepared for it. He came not to grant peace, but division. And that already begins here and now. And be ready. Be prepared. Make sure. Make it clear whose side you are in. And whose side unbelievers are in. And if they resent that, you have to live with that. You have to live with that. And that is even true in the church. You see, the church is often coward to accepting unbelievers into its membership. That it becomes a family institution. It becomes a church institution. And the separation is not clear. But we must be prepared. Oh, but that will just leave a few of us. So what? The separation has begun. And we must be prepared for that. Because when Christ returns, He's going to separate perfectly, completely His people from those are not. And if I am speaking here to someone who is still on the world side and seek to be reconciled to God through his son, the Lord Jesus, do not wait until everything is too late. Do not wait until the final separation takes place. And it will no longer be reversible. Don't wait until God, you stand before God as judge and he sentence you to pay for all your sins in hell forever. And if you look at the signs of the times in the light of prophecy. We don't know how long, but the, but the increasing frequency and intensity of natural calamities that Jesus said must precede his second coming is becoming more obvious. Settle your accounts with God. Seek reconciliation with him. Because the wind, the earthquake that terrified people, that's nothing compared to the terror when the Lord returns to separate completely his own and those who are not. Trust in Christ. Be reconciled to him. Be on the Lord's side. Make sure that you are reconciled to God through his son before that day happens. Let's pray.